Good morning. I am Reverend Elena Simone Tyler, and I serve as Associate Pastor for Justice and Mission here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. Carol Frisch helped us to pull this forum together, and she is not able to be here this morning. So I will introduce our speaker um, on behalf of Carol. We are pleased, that is Westminster Presbyterian Church and the Social Justice Ministry team, to welcome Michelle Witt. Each, each year we pick a, a theme for the forum that we build each forum around, and this year the theme is diving deeper together so all will flourish. This theme builds on our heightened awareness of the systemic and critical issues affecting our community brought to greater attention in recent years, most especially in response to the killing of George Floyd right here in Minneapolis. Through the forums, we learn about longstanding needs and become more prepared to support the flourishing of all members of our community. So Michelle Witt is here with us today. She is the executive director of the League of Women Voters Minnesota. She will address redistricting, voting rights, fair elections, and what we can do to support our democracy. Michelle has served in government and as an elected school board member for South Washington County Schools. The League of Women Voters Minnesota is committed to civic engagement through the work of 35 community-based chapters with more than 2,300 members here in Minnesota and more than 750 chapters throughout the U.S. For those who are here in the MISO room, when we get to the point in our presentation where we can take questions and comments, please raise your hands and I'll bring a mic around. And for those of you who are joining us uh, over the live stream, please post your comments and questions in the chat. So thank you so much. Grateful that you're all here and I will turn it over to Michelle. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much, Elena. And I have this wonderful vision of all of you out there in your beds, all cozy with your coffee, which is a great way to learn. And I am wonderful, wonderfully grateful to be here today to talk to all of you. So, um, so today we're going to talk about voting rights. And we're going to talk about history, too. Two things that you never thought would be controversial, but are these days to learn our history and to talk about voting rights. But um, really, as we look, uh, what I had the great privilege of during the centennial of the 19th Amendment was to really dig deeper, uh, looking at your, your forum message here into the history of voting rights and our democracy. And this was really helpful. And I hope today what you'll leave with is a sense of hope. Seeing it, I'm in a place of faith. I think I can go for hope today, right? There's a lot going on, but there's a reason to be hopeful, and I hope to communicate that. Because to me, that's what really spurs action a lot, right? So to understand voting rights today, we're going to take a little uh, step into our past. And so if you look at voting rights in the past, 102 years ago, when the 19th Amendment was on the verge of passage and the League of Women Voters was forming, here's what was going on, OK? A major war was ending. I think about Afghanistan and World War I. There was strong anti-immigrant sentiment. In Minnesota, it was against the Scandinavians. And the Scandinavian Suffrage Society planned to change its name because there was so much uh, backlash. Systemic racism was killing black men. And there was a horrible lynching, the horrible lynching of the four black men in Duluth was during this time. Suffragists were protesting and being arrested at the White House. There was severe voter repression, suppression, right? All women and Native Americans, and actually most all people of color were not able to vote in their elections. And a worldwide pandemic was in full swing, killing 675,000 people in the US. So take a look at that, right? Here we are, does this sound familiar? 102 years later, major world war ending, not a lot of world war, major war with what we dealt with and with Afghanistan. Strong anti-immigrant sentiment, not Scandinavians anymore, but here we are. Systemic racism, killing black men. Uh, protesting, being arrested at the White House. I was one of those people. I have a lovely arrest record. Uh, I can tell you about that later, but uh, <laughs> we, um, severe voter suppression, right? And a worldwide pandemic in full swing. So. I think it's important to take that in a minute 
and you want to th you sort of think about really <laughs> has did nothing change or has everything changed so I like to put this slide, I threw this one back in, 1918, in Minnesota, in our history, the Scandinavian roots were really strong with, our, with the suffrage movement. But again, they um, really had, there was a lot of backlash. And the Scandinavians, I'm Finnish, one of my Scandinavian heritage, Finnish were especially kind of known as the people of color back in the day when they first came. So a lot of history there. So again, has nothing changed or has everything changed? So when we look at voting rights, we, what we see is the ongoing march toward our rights becoming more accessible to everyone. The 15th Amendment gave African American men the right to vote in 1870. That's also a great story if you want some good holiday reading with um, the relationship between Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass. Suffrage really began um, out of the, the abolitionist movement and there was a lot of ties until this moment um, when there was a, a move to instead go for what they could get, Frederick Douglass at the time, to try to get the vote for black men. Uh, but women were not a part of that. And then there was a lot of friction in the movement. So friction in movements, you know, goes back <laughs> to time. The 19th Amendment, again, ratified in 1920, and we say expanding voting rights for women. Native American women weren't citizens until 1924, and most all people of color still could not access the right to vote, right? The 24th Amendment, where we start to get now to the Civil Rights Movement and Voting Rights Act, ratified in 1964, eliminating poll taxes. I was born in 62, so this now we're in our lifetime, okay? So all of that, here we go, right? Now, and then the 26th Amendment, ratified in 1971, lowering the voting age to 18. What was going on in 71? Anybody in my audience here? The Vietnam War, right? So these circumstances have continued to push us forward. So here we go, we continue past, we go to 75, the Voting Rights Act of 65. That is what we're still, what we'll be talking about today that is still with us today, but also still challenged today. But you also had ADA, right? Accessibility for elderly and the handicapped of 1984. That had a big effect on opening up voting for people with disabilities. The National Voter Registration Act, the Help America Vote Act of 2002 is something we've been very involved in that provided federal funding to update voter systems. In the state of Minnesota, we as the league had to fight to get that money to come from, we, the federal government approved it, but we're one of only three states when federal money comes to us, um, the, the state legislature has to approve it. And we're also one of the only states that has a divided legislature, um, which is of interest and explains why it's difficult to get anything done. So we did get money to help us with cybersecurity issues. So as you can see, and hopefully you'll realize, the road to a more inclusive and perfect democracy marches slowly but steadily forward. We have continued and we are continuing in this place of moving our democracy forward. And so I'd like to throw this slide in there. Um, I love this from the League of Women Voters. All this comes of teaching girls to read, you know, that whole problem of when women become educated, what they do. <laughs> but this picture here is fun on the left from 1918, the University of Minnesota Women's Suffrage Club, and now voter registration volunteers at a naturalization ceremony. You all are gonna have a naturalization ceremony here, I think next week or the week after. Uh, we do all of the voter registration for newly naturalized citizens, which could be eight to 9,000 people a year. So I think it's really helpful as you, as we've learned through some of the rhetoric going on now, learning about our history for whatever reason is controversial, but we have a history and we need to learn it and it's important to understand and give you a context. Um, registering voters then and now, I love this for picture on the left of the first, um, when women got the vote, registering women to vote, but we're still going out door to door registering people to vote. We still don't have automatic voter registration even when you're a citizen in our country. We're still working on empowering people with their rights. 
raising your voice then and now. I like the picture on the left is a 1914 suffrage rally outside of Landmark Center in St. Paul Hotel. And in the far right is a Students Demand Action rally that we were part of um, in 19, well, in 20, 20 where, what, what years are we in? I guess 2018. So the point is, we keep doing the same thing. Democracy requires us to keep registering, to keep raising our voice, and to keep showing up. And so I, want, I put this slide in because I think it's also really important to understand. If you look at what US voters did in 2016, voted in Trump and Pence. Two years later, just two years later, the same voters in the country showed up in record numbers and elected 128 women, the most diverse set of women, the most women and the most diverse group of women ever. So again, we have the power to make a more inclusive and democratic country when we show up. Also fund this little first for Minnesota women. Another thing, when you look, all the world women on the top, um, Maybeth Heard Page was one of the first women to be elected to the Minnesota State Legislature in 1923. And then the next first for women took a good 30 years. Uh, Koya Knutson, a lot of you might have heard of her, first woman elected to the US Congress. Then another 20 years, Rosalie Wall, first woman to serve on the Minnesota Supreme Court, et cetera. All those women on the top I like to point out because they were also all legal women voters members, so I am a little partial. But you look at that and then you look at the, all the women on the bottom, right? Mi Mua, first Hmong American. Michelle Bachman was the first Republican woman to be elected to the US House of Representatives. In 2007, it took for a Republican woman to be elected to the House. Ilhan Omar, Peggy Flanagan, Angie Craig, Native American, uh, openly gay and lesbian groups. So we have all of this wonderful new diversity coming into our state. But again, over time, over the 102 years, well, hello, Vivian. <laughs> that it's taken um, to get where we are today. So I often say, I like, especially when I talk to young people, I say, okay, well, 1848 was when Seneca Falls occurred when they first had the idea of, let's go for votes for women. It took 72 years. So everyone raise your hand, what would you do today if you knew it was gonna take 72 years? And no one raises their hands. But that is what democracy has always required of us, is to do what we do with what we have today for those who are gonna come behind us, because somebody came ahead of us. So the bottom line, we need to show up. We need to be involved. We need to continue to learn our history. I also have a, a postcard over here. If you guys haven't had a chance to go to the Minnesota History Center through January, you'll see a wonderful exhibit called Extraordinary Women that outlines not just the white women, which we often hear about connected to suffrage, but we really dug deeper and looked at all of the different voices of women uh, and women of color in our, in our state and how they have affected the political landscape. It's a great exhibit. Um, also, the Votes for Women exhibit is one you can do again, snuggled from your bed with your coffee. This is a virtual exhibit. It was the original exhibit that was supposed to go up before COVID hit, but it's a wonderful history um, of the women and men also who paved that way for the votes we, voting rights we enjoy today. Uh, one of the suffragists we really have enjoyed getting to learn is Nellie Griswold Francis. And it really is so exciting to find and to have had the time to dig deeper and bring these voices forward. Because Nellie is quite an amazing woman. She f uh, founded, in 1914, 25 African American women held the charter meeting of the Every Woman Suffrage Club. So there was a segregated suffrage club. We know that Nellie did talk with Clara Euland, who was as sort of the head of the suffrage movement at the time, but there was definitely a segregated world. Um, but what's amazing to me about Nellie is what happened after we got the vote, um, she went to the legislature, one of the first women to lobby at the legislature and with the anti-lynching bill. The, anti, the actual 
copy of the anti-lynching bill is at the exhibit. It just make, gives me chills when I look at it um, and was passed. So again, women really fought for the right to vote, not for the privilege, but for the justice they could seek, which is what we do today. We vote because we want to get things done. We want the world to be a more inclusive um, and fair world for everybody. And she did that with the anti-lynching bill. So I think that history, I want to take us now um, to where we are today. So as you can see, we are continuing, and we will continue to grow our democracy. And the big thing right now when people are like, what is going on with all these crazy voting rights bills? Well, it really boils down to one big thing that happened, and that was in 2013 when the US Supreme Court struck down a key provision of the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act of 65 really helped to protect us from states uh, being able to do things that brought discrimination into the voting process through a lot of legal terms called preclearance. The bottom line was the Voting Rights Act said, if you, state of Mississippi or Minnesota or whoever you are, are gonna change your voting rules, because every state has their own rules, but if you're gonna change your rules and they, they affect or discriminate people um, or violate their civil rights, you have to go through a committee. There was a commission to review that and make sure that that doesn't happen, that we don't go back to poll taxes and Jim Crow laws. And that has been very effective in thwarting um, widespread voter suppression. But that was struck down um, in 5-4 decision so this is what we're dealing with now. Uh, Pre-clearance is what they call it. Uh, massively successful um, originally in improving voting access, but now has left a huge void. And the laws you see in Texas and elsewhere are sprouting up um, as a result of that. Here in Minnesota, we are very lucky to live in Minnesota. <laughs> we, we do have a very... Um, wonderful voting culture and system in place. Uh, thanks to the work of our Secretary of State and our government officials who, for the most part, up until the last 10 years, really have worked as a bipartisan basis to make sure that voting does not become a political uh, issue. And so we have the top voting turnout in the nation. Again, we had it the last two elections. But we have had a lot of things to work on. So again, today, one of the things that we dealt with was cybersecurity. Minnesota was one of the top, um, what, one of the states that the Russians attempted to hack. Um, we talked about these Help America Vote Act funds. Uh, we, have, we, we do not require voter ID at the time of voting in Minnesota. Uh, we, we do have voter ID, however, in Minnesota. People often say, well, how are you going to know who you are? Well, we have that through the voter registration process. You know, when you register to vote, you have to show your ID. Your ID needs to be reconciled with who you are. You are who you say you are, and you live where you say you do. So don't let anyone fool you. We do have voter ID. We just don't require a second version of it at the polls. Um, data privacy is another big thing. If you know, we, what was the, we had a big new thing happen in Minnesota, which was our presidential primary. And the presidential primary now meant that you had to declare your party um, in order to vote in that. But that there was a big move by an organization that wanted all of that information to become public so that your voter role, that right now if somebody wants to see who's registered to vote, where they live, and what they believe in, that is all public information. But what is not public is your party, who you voted for, and how you voted in that election. So we had to fight against that, and we did win that. Um, so we're, we're suing a lot. We don't like to sue. People say, why are you suing? Well, because the legal system is also part of our democracy. And when we're in a stalemate with the legislature, the courts are a way that we can continue to seek justice. Um, felon disenfranchisement, so also known as restore the vote. This is another big issue you might hear about. Really interesting to follow in Florida. I'll come back to that. But in Minnesota, if you are, um, have served your time in prison and you come out and you're a member of the community and you're working, you cannot vote until you have completed your full sentence. But that means your parole and you have to be off paper. And Minnesota has this weird 
thing where we feel we're very progressive on some areas, but we have one of the worst uh, records of incarceration of people of color and of long probations after service. So we have, a, this affects about 60,000 people, and it is, this has been a bipartisan issue. Um, so why we can't get it passed is very frustrating, but we remain at the forefront of trying to enfranchise um, all citizens, including those who have served their sentence. Um, and COVID-19, of course, that created a lot of new things. So for us, um, what we had to deal with, obviously we won a lawsuit to be able to um, uh, waive the witness signature during COVID. And we had to um, fight off, these are some of the, the things we've been working on. Um, October 2020, halting the planned voter intimidation from the private mercenary contractor, Atlas Aegis. So if you miss that little, you know, James Bond thing, there was a group of people literally um, hiring in groups like Soldier of Fortune, Soldier of Fortune, um, military thugs to come out, <laughs> I should say post-military, not attached to the military, to come out and guard our polls because um, of the fear of what was happening in Minnesota, right, after the murder of George Floyd and thinking we better protect the polls. Well, we got them to stay where they were too. So we're also now, that brings us to current time. So we also have now um, our redistricting work. So redistricting in Minnesota, we had the census, right? So once again, Minnesota, yay, top self-reporting numbers in the nation. Um, I, again, completely attribute this to the League of Women Voters. But um, we were very active, but so was our state. There was a Minnesota, um, a huge mobilization partnership that was led by the Minnesota Council on Foundations, Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. There was over 100 of us working together as groups to make sure that everyone is counted. And that now leads to redistricting. And redistricting, uh, we could spend a whole hour talking about that, but it is the heart of fair representation. A lot of people just are like, oh yeah, this is gonna happen now, but this is the time to pay attention. We've been working hard to get people to testify. But what I'm really proud of is the work we've been doing to try to end gerrymandering through uh, bringing up communities of interest. This would be probably the first time in the last 60 years we've been successful in partnering with communities around the state, greater Minnesota, communities of color, to help people define what is my community. So what does fair representation mean? It means representing communities, not pulling apart uh, the white earth nation, for example. Um, those types of things that help us live in a place where it is not slanted to one political party or another. And so we, um, the legislature, again, being stuck in their, uh, in their divided state, has not been able to come up with maps. So for the 60th year, uh, we, it will go to the courts. Um, they are still taking hearings, but we, don't, we expect it to end up still in the courts. The decisions will be made in February, but the League of Women Voters joined as a co-plaintiff um, in a lawsuit and what that means is we have a really great voice right now, um, and you all have a voice, but we've been bringing that community of interest to the table, and we really see that. The court, for the first time, is really, I think, taking that into account. This week, we will be posting draft maps that will be recommended to the court panel on our website, so it's kind of getting exciting. It's a little trailer to what's happening, but by February 14th, the vote will be made, and we will have a whole new mapped Minnesota. So, again, we're lucky we live here, but we do have, we've got some interesting gerrymandering. Uh, Rochester is a great, great uh, um, visualization of that. Uh, if anyone wants to learn more, I'd be happy to chat about that. But, um, so anyway, uh, and now, you know, you think, oh, we're going to get through that. We got through this. And now we have our new challenge, right? So every time you think you got a nice plan, now we have to tell, find out how do we deal with people who say we don't, we're not telling the truth about our elections. How do we deal with people saying our elections were not valid? How do we know and how, how we have to communicate how we know our 2020 elections were fair and accurate? 
So we did a webinar back in March with about nine uh, election officials and election secretary of state, Steve Simon, and other officials around the state. And we're going to put that webinar um, as a visual on our website. Uh, we're working on that now to launch that to really show how our system works. So we're kind of back to civics here, right? OK, if you were going to, if there was going to be fraud, um, that would be interesting to see how you get by the fact that we have a Republican and Democrat almost at every single juncture of where a ballot goes. So we're going to need to, and to be able to better educate people about how it works. Elections are actually very interesting when you dig into it, and you've never really had to think about it because we've trusted it, but now people are losing that trust. So we're going to dig deeper for you. Um, so I like this, th this whole thing of digging deeper with what you're doing with your forum <laughs> because that's really what we're trying to do is dig deeper to educate people about it and how we know our elections are fair and accurate and to build up that trust again with the American people. Um, I love this quote, one of my favorites. Um, Ours is not the struggle of one day, one week, or one year. Ours is not the struggle of one judicial appointment or presidential term. Ours is the struggle of a lifetime, or even many lifetimes, and each one of us in every generation must do our part. From the wonderful civil rights leader and congressman John Lewis. And I think that's really the point. Each one of us is given the circumstances we have of the time. You know, 102 years ago, they had the same circumstances we did. They had a worldwide pandemic, the end of World War I, they were lynching black men. I mean, this was not like, you know, a cakewalk. So we also were like, okay, well, we just have to do our thing. And, and that's what I'm proud of. Of course, I'm proud of the League because we keep doing what I often say is the boring work of democracy. But I look at what that means, like candidate forums, learning about your candidates, right? Those are important things before you go to vote. Um, the school board forums, so many of them this year were very contentious, right? We had a lot going on on these school board races and very and I was very thankful to the league for being out there but how many people do you think vote in the in the in local elections well we were really lucky in our community where we finally got to 20% because it had been 10% 10 20% of people voting in local elections where do you think people who are running for Congress come from. <laughs> so, so I'm on a personal crusade, too, of getting these local elections to be uh, something on everybody's radar. Um, I do have these little flyers back there about the league if you want to take when you go, but I want to just end with, um, we need you on the front line of our democracy, because all of this is to say there's a lot going on. And a lot of people, there's a lot to do. Voting is one of them, for sure, the big thing. But there are other things you can do. Um, registering, obviously helping register others. You have your naturalization ceremonies, right? Um, pledging to vote. We have a text service, especially we try to get young people to do that. It's interesting, our youth vote in Minnesota is still about 20% less than the average vote. We had the highest youth voter turnout of people 25 and under in the country but it still was only at about 60%. And I do feel when we talk to youth, a lot of youth feel like, well, I, the candidates aren't right for me. I didn't like the candidates. I didn't like the choices. I didn't like, you know, there's a lot of reasons, but we need to inspire and involve and empower our young people to, to realize too that we have, there's a lot for us here uh, to do that, and it not, doesn't necessarily mean doing it is that you get the result you want. Right? How many times do we vote for things and work for things that don't happen? But again, that's our history. That's what we've done. And at some point in time, all of those beans right, that we put into the pot spill over and create amazing change. And that's what our history shows us. Learning, like you are today. I mean, I think it's wonderful. I still love any time anyone asks me to go anywhere, I will talk about this at any time because it's it, we have to keep learning and understanding the importance. So thank you for doing the forum ongoingly and being a part of it. Acting for change, working with others. Um, a lot of us who are white need to work with people who aren't. It's just the, the bottom line is we need to find people who don't look like us and get together and learn and do things together. And we've 
really been doing that a lot with redistricting and the census. Those were wonderful opportunities. And I, I just love the vibrant cultures we have in our, in our state and lots of opportunity for us. Advocating, writing letters. Remember letters? <laughs> letters still matter. You know, emails, when you're emailing your local officials, kind of easy to like not read an email. But when something comes in the mail, it's opened. Um, so I, you know, some of these old things, calling on the phone, remember that, that phone thing? So there's still important ways to advocate. The other big thing, challenging, misinformation and disinformation, right? Getting your news from multiple sources. Okay, this is hard, right? I turn my channel from, I won't say, from one to the other, and it's really hard. But it's really important to see and understand where everyone is coming from in our country. To, uh, whether you agree with it or not agree with it, we need to be challenging our filters. Becoming involved as election judges. This is a really big thing. And one of the other things we're doing with the league, um, starting with Thanksgiving through the holidays, is we are going to have an opportunity for any of you and for people to sign letters of thank you that will go out to our election officials at the end of the year. We want to thank them for all the great work they're doing because they are being harassed and they are feeling undermined and we want to let them know we appreciate them. But we're losing people. It takes about 30,000 election judges and to run a general election. So we need people to continue to play those roles. Um, supporting, yep, yeah, we talked about that. Volunteering, just good citizenship, right? Modeling good citizenship. I'm sure I'm, sp I'm speaking to the crowd here this morning, but all the little things we do, remember, they add up. They do. Um, and join, of course, a local league, but any group, there are groups. Joining is on the decline. Being part of organizations that are working together on the front lines are declining. We need to stay involved in those activities. All right, so continue to understand our history. Uh, I love this slide. Minnesota denies the vote to criminals, lunatics, idiots, and women. Is this chivalry? On the left, you see that banner, and on the right is the banner in storage at the Historical Society. Um, we have come somewhere. We, we've made some progress, folks. Um, and continue to seek justice. Our rights were given to us by those who blazed the trail in front of us. How will we help to continue that trail for those who are coming behind us. So I hope that gives you a little overview today of where we're at and a little hope to realize that things were a lot worse at one point, but they, can, they will, will always be given challenges no matter where we are in our history. And it is our job to continue to pursue justice even though it doesn't always give us the answers we want in the years we're here to do it. So I'm open for questions. Anybody have questions? And I'm happy for technical questions. A lot of people ask me, one of the most common questions I get is, how do you stay nonpartisan during these times? So the League of Women Voters, we do not support candidates, or we do not support candidates nor political parties. But we are political, meaning we study and take action on issues. And that's the difference between partisanship and being political. But we're also partisan people because we're voters first. So we go into, you know, we do things. We all vote for candidates, so we're making partisan decisions. And so for me, with the League of Women Voters, I say our issues have stayed the same. I mean, they've stayed the same. But the parties who support our issues have changed. And that we can't help, but we need to stay strong uh, on our issues. Yeah, Barb. It's fun to see some leaguers in the audience. I can call you by name. <laughs> I'm just wondering, what do you see as one of the biggest issues coming up in the upcoming legislature is starting in? It's a, it's a short legislature. Right, it's the bonding, right? So this is the bonding session. And it's going to be interesting, right? Because we just passed the infrastructure bill and we have a lot to, a lot to bond. Um, I think a couple things. This is also the last legislature session of these legislators, because then redistricting will happen and we'll have a whole new, I mean, they're probably the same people, but we're representing different people, different areas. I think the, the biggest thing will be what we have seen, which is nothing. <laughs> 
The biggest thing is all of the, the good news is all the bad things we don't want to happen. So on the voting side, we do have a strong contingent of legislators who want to a more, want to bring voter ID back to voting itself, that want to bring what we call the provisional ballots back. That is a term for maybe ballots. You know, right now in the state of Minnesota, because we have same day registration, if you come and say, I am who I say I am, I live where I say I do, under threat of perjury, like why you would risk that, I don't know, you can self-certify yourself and say, I am Michelle Witte, I live at this address. And, um, and they're like, well, we don't think you are, but they will let me vote. But in 47 other states, if somebody challenges your identity, they can say, well, we're not sure. We're gonna put your vote over here in this provisional pile. And you need to go find more evidence that you are who you are. So we fight very hard against voter ID and provisional ballots. Now in reality, we're, that isn't gonna pass here because it is a Republican-led effort. We have the governor and the House that are Democratic that will not allow that. Um, on the other side, all the good things that are gonna happen, they're not gonna happen either. So I think there's gonna be a lot of mm. Now that's however you look at that. Um, I do think that the other big fight we have is around getting federal money approved by the state because that is a place where, again, just on the way it's working, that the Republican Senate has traditionally made that difficult. So that could be an issue we see. Um, we also, we have sort of three big priority issues with the league. Um, we have a lot of issues. If you go on our website, you'll see. But our three big priority ones certainly are this democracy, but also racial justice um, and climate change. So we work with a lot of volunteer lobbyists on climate change. I think there's going to be an effort to really address all these new bonding bills, being able to find out, well, what is the impact to our environment and climate as a result, and trying to make sure that new building happens with some sensitivity to that. So, I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah, Vivian. Yeah, hi, thanks so much, Michelle. Um, one of the things that I just want to um, take a moment to say is that people don't realize that men can join the league. <laughs> yes, and men can has, join. Yeah, and it has been uh, men who were lawyers who helped us, uh, at least during my term as president, uh, who helped us fend off um, frivolous lawsuits. And believe me, there are a lot of frivolous lawsuits trying to shut down what we do. So that is that is one area of volunteerism. I, <laughs> I hope that somebody will step up and say, I want to do that. And another thing, Michelle, I just have to brag for a minute. My dad, uh, we're from Selma. And uh, we were run out of Selma, but that's another story. <laughs> but anyway, Dad was finally acknowledged for a civil rights activity this summer by the Historical Society of Nebraska. Hmm. Now, the interesting part about that is uh, he and Mom, you know, were marching, 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 and marching, singing songs, marching, being hit in the head, and clubbed, and all that sort of thing. And so I take this whole thing very personally. Uh, this I grew up with this. And to see us go back uh, uh, into these terrible things uh, that they fought so hard for, I just, I'll just keep talking it up. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vivian. And yeah, we are very, um, Vivian was one of our presidents of the State League, which is so it's very exciting to have her here. And um, as you say, we're open to all genders now. So people have also asked me, well, what about in our world of where we are with gender? We are not always talking about men and women. We're looking at gender across the spectrum. And so I think about the League of Women Voters has been very serious about maintaining who we are in our words, sort of like the National Association, of, you know, the Advancement of Colored People. NAACP, we don't say colored people, but it is the history, right? It's understanding that. The same thing with women voters. It's the history that brought us to life, but we are open to all. And we are inclusive of all, working on that. 
it is a work in progress, I would say, right? We have a big commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion um, at the League, as so many organizations do now, which is wonderful to have that new filter and lens to do our work. It forces us to be better and to dig deeper. Oh, I'm coming back to that message all the time. So um, anyway, thank you. Yes. Michelle, a question about advocacy, because part of what you're presentation was getting at is what can we do and so whether it is restoration of voting rights for those who are returning from incarceration whether it is advocating for not having such long um, probation periods what kind of advocacy is the league recommending um, around especially to, to make sure people can right yes freely and easily great great question so what can you do so um, so there's the, the things in terms of advocacy is really the first thing is knowing who all of your local officials are. It's amazing how many people just really don't know. So knowing who they are and staying in touch with them, it makes a real difference. It was weird, you know, for me serving on the school board, which is not, you know, like these higher things, but there's no doubt that the people who stay in touch with you help educate you and help you be a better legislator. And that's to me what advocacy is, I think, is about helping legislators to have better information because they can't know everything. Advocacy is often seen, you know, we have our times for shouting and protesting and doing those things, but I really feel like, for example, if we, like, felon enfranchisement. We have a web page called Restore the Vote on our website where you can learn about it. So the first thing is learning about it. What is this Restore the Vote thing? Secondly, be willing to learn more, subscribe, be part of it, let me know you want to volunteer or whatever, and we can put you as a volunteer lobbyist, which doesn't mean you have to go to the Capitol or even know the issue. But we really need people who can call their local official and say, listen, there is this bill right now, and it's really important to me, because that's who local officials listen to, uh, you. They don't listen to me, if I, you know, my do, but they're not gonna listen to me, they're gonna listen to the voters, people who vote for them. So continuing to look for that, there's lots of great groups, certainly Isaiah, you probably all know, uh, uh, hopefully about Isaiah, which is wonderful, multi-faith, interfaith, organization that lobbies on so many important issues. There's, it doesn't need to be the league, but find a spot and, and pay attention, know your people, talk to them about issues. That's a big thing. I also think it's the intentional communication among your peers and your colleagues. And um, when people are bringing up things, um, mis challenging misinformation. Um, it's, you know, we'll all have probably some interesting holiday talks around <laughs> a lot of issues but don't let that let that be a part like embrace that right that is what it is it's about being able to be civil and talk and disagree and we need to be role models for what that looks like um to just yell at everyone <laughs> i mean think of when you were persuaded you know i mean it is we we need to find ways to have those difficult conversations keep having them keep putting them out that you never know when your advocacy affects someone else uh, because you tell your story. I mean, Vivian telling her story, I mean, ooh, uh, that, that's a, that motivates me. Tell, tell your stories, you all have them. Uh, my quick story was about when I was in college in the 80s, you know, I didn't have money or time, but I could get on a bus. Well, we had this thing called apartheid. Anybody remember apartheid? <laughs> and we had these illegal wars in Central America. Remember those? So I, and we had the arms race. So I got on buses and we did civil disobedience and got arrested and, cause that's what I could do. But when I brought my daughter to DC, um, it was like 20 years later and there was a bus going by with this big sign on it showing that South Africa was gonna be hosting the World Cup. And I literally just started to sob. My daughter's like, what is going on? And I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, because we were standing right by the White House. I'm like, 20 years ago, I was literally getting arrested right here for that issue. Now, did I alone do that? Of course not. But I was a part of that. And everyone, if they, everyone does what John Lewis asks us to do, our part it makes a difference. It made a difference. It always has, it always will. Don't get too depressed, we have our moments, We're, but we need to 
It's on Tehran, right, Vivian? <laughs> Any other questions? One, uh, another question for you, Michelle. How is it that we see this commitment to free and open elections falling along party lines, and what can we do about that? How do we get past, um, I mean, my right to vote being something that's just, and I'm an African American woman, not on camera right now. Yeah. Um, but that my right of vote, it doesn't, it shouldn't matter which party. So how did we get there? And are you hopeful about how we get past that? Well, it is the question of the day. If I had an answer, ooh, you know, I think it is a challenging time in terms of the partisanship. Um, I would, I, I feel like the the real answer is un, is is. As minor as it might sound is we keep telling the stories. We keep telling our story. We keep working for our rights. For us, we stay involved at the Capitol, the League. We keep pushing on, no, you will not <laughs> ask us for additional ID that costs more money, that makes it harder to vote. We keep making those issues transparent. We keep having those conversations. We have had times, I mean, remember, the other thing to remember, you know, I have this vivid recollection of, you know, Maddie, um, um, Dolly Madison, right, running out of the White House because it was on fire, right? We've, you know, we've had very partisan times before. Um, and so, but what happened in those partisan times? People don't stand for it, too. So one of the things I will say that is gets edgy for people is about the election. And we did, as League of Women Voters, call out 14 Republican senators who asked to be signed on to the Texas Attorney General lawsuit, throwing out the election results. We're like, you just, you, they lied. When there is a lie, we're willing to say you lied. Now that is difficult for people because in the league we've had some challenges with that where people are like, well, we're being partisan because we're directing it only at Republicans. Well, we, I, I don't care if you're a Republican or you're a Democrat, you just lied about something as fundamental as the security of our whole nation. We're gonna call that out. So I do think we do need to be a little bit heightened on that calling out. Another quick little read in one of my favorite little books um, of late that answers that question maybe better than I can is um, Timothy, Tim, Timothy Snyder from Yale called, it's the 20 Lessons on Tyranny. And it's, it's a really quick read, but it, the idea is, you, you know, there are a lot of democratic nations that were, that fell to fascism in the 30s and 40s. And he talks about what happened. And some of that is like, you just got to keep on saying, uh-uh, <laughs> no, this is not how it goes. And we need to call it out when and where it is. We can't say, well, that's not so bad. So an example would be, um, Annette Meeks was on NPR, and she made a mention of, you know, well, of course, all this voter fraud we know is going on. And there was no challenge by uh, the Almanac folks on, wait, you can't just throw that out there. So I wrote to Almanac, and I'm like, you need to challenge when people say lies. Now, I don't know whether they will or they won't. I didn't hear back. But we need to do that. We need to keep doing that, keep the information, keep the conversations going, being willing to sign up and sign on to things that protect voting rights. It, will be a struggle, it always has been, it will continue to be, but we are moving forward. The moving back part, I, you know what Vivian is saying, we're taking a step back, there's no doubt, in, um, all in especially in our southern states. Um, and so there's also probably opportunities or will be opportunities to support those states because we may not have the same thing here, but don't neglect your local communities because again, what if we had 100% vote? I mean, that would solve it, right, if people showed up to vote. So we still need to work on that as well. Yeah. Hi. Um, do you sense any movement to get civics back in the lexicons of high school, junior and senior high school curriculum? Yeah, so actually, we um, have partnered with Representative Erdahl, who is a Republican, just saying, we work with Republicans and Democrats. Um, we will be back at the civics bill. Again, he has worked very hard to try to get the civics bill going forward. Um, now, it was interesting because I also, having sat on the school, on school board and learning a little bit about education, 
Um, part of the challenge of the civics of civics education is that there's a lot of things we want people to know, right? And there's a lot of things, um, there's only so much time in the day. And so I think the other part of civics education, um, there is a political science requirement, so there is sort of this discretion at the point of social studies teachers how that gets taught. So I think there's, we are working on that. So that's the short answer. And that is something we could reach out to you and this social justice group, I mean, knowing that we have these league leaders here and maybe interested people when policy comes up that you could act on, we'd be happy to share that with you. Um, but I also think we can't give it all to the schools. <laughs> I mean, I think that's the other thing is that we need to also in our communities um, embrace that. So we have, for example, a youth fellow program as part of the league and local leagues who are bringing in youth to help them experience our democracy. So I think we all need to be more intentional with those types, you know, with our, our groups out there to make civics happen. Yeah. Michelle, I'm glad you mentioned this youth fellows. What other outreach are you doing to bring in, uh, uh, multiple generations into the league's work? Yeah, so great question. So our Youth Fellows Program has been really exciting. There's, um, you know, and I'm always so encouraged, right, to see how wonderful um, our youth are. And I'm like, oh, we're gonna be fine, folks. I mean, there's just some smart, excited, wonderful students out there. So that's been something we're really working to grow. And we do that through our local leagues. So we do pass through grants to help our local leagues to find students. The other thing are more intentional partnerships. And I think that really is at the heart of what for us it means to be inclusive, is to look to where we can partner. And we've really had a wonderful partnership now with Rose McGee, Sweet Potato Comfort Pie, if you haven't had a chance to look at her great website. and. Um, her work, and she is so great at um, using her skills to, again, just look at racial healing, but also outreach to, especially to youth. So partnering is a big way for us. We also, um, through our work with redistricting, did mapping in, in communities all around the state. So one of the groups is the Council of um, um, uh, the American, let's see, Council of American Islamic Relations, Minnesota, CARE Minnesota. We work a lot with the Muslim community. Ayata Leeds is a great group of Muslim women who are really also wanting so much to help get their communities not just registered to vote, but also citizenship. So that's another new thing on our radar is helping people become citizens. We feel there's probably like 60, 70,000 Minnesotans eligible, but that have not gone through the process. So it is a slow but sure process of, of engagement. Thank you, Michelle. Any other questions in the room for Michelle? Well, I will just note that your neighbor, Rosemary Nelson, is watching Mary. and um, <laughs> expressing gratitude for your work. And I express my gratitude on behalf of the Social Justice Ministry team and Westminster Presbyterian Church for your being here, Michelle. Thank and I you. Know That's great. Michelle will hang back for a couple of questions, and there's some very good material available here, including the online. Um, Women's yes. History yep. Exhibit. Mm -hmm. yep. So, so you definitely grab want to those look at cards. That. Yep. So thank you very much, yes. Michelle. And I feel like we just got the tip of the iceberg. So we'll definitely check the website and um, Great. make you. And hi, Carol research. Frisch. Thanks for inviting me as well. Yes, yes. Carol, I'm sure, is watching. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Yep. So next week, we won't gather for the Social Justice Forum because we will have the opportunity to participate in the Fair Trade Gift Fair. When we um, use our purchasing power in this way, we're helping our siblings from around the world to um, have sustainable income. So thanks for being here today, and we hope to see you next week for the Fair Trade Gift Fair. <laughs>